For those unfamiliar with Odyssey, this component of Elite Dangerous adds a first-person exploration and combat system to the already successful Elite Dangerous Horizons expansion. This was a bit of a controversial move by Frontier that has definitely evolved the game in a way that I think was inevitable. But it introduced some mechanics that have been difficult to navigate and are the reason it's taken me this long to really dig into the content here. The Odyssey ground game can be broken down into three general experiences, reflected by the three base model suits that players can purchase. The Dominator for combat, the Maverick for salvage, or scavenging, and the Artemis for exploration. Each suit brings unique advantages and disadvantages intended to encourage players to use the specific suit for a specific activity. There is enough nuance to the system that, when fighting NPCs, it's possible to use the other suits to good effect for combat. But you will be generally more vulnerable than in a Dominator suit. The first time you start Odyssey, you will be given a standard flight suit. Basically, the same flight suit your character has always been wearing in Horizons, with the option to add the various cosmetics you may have purchased for your given commander. This flight suit can't be engineered, has minimal weapons, shielding, armor, and oxygen, making it essentially the Class E module of Odyssey suits, adequate only for sitting in your ship and walking around stations. Nearly every station you can visit will have a pioneer supplier who sells suits, consumables, and weapons, with the three basic suits generally available for purchase everywhere. The availability of weapons is a bit more random, but you can be assured that there will always be a few Tier 1 guns on offer. Each Pioneer supplier has a random roll chance to carry a pre-engineered suit or weapon, with an occasional engineering upgrade ready to go. More powerful suits and weapons are more rare, though with some effort and a lot of patience, it's possible to locate Tier 3 equipment over time by making sure to visit the Pioneer supplier every time you stop at a port. Unfortunately, this strategy is actually the most efficient way to get started engineering, as the process of collecting all the components needed to upgrade a suit is probably the single worst part of Odyssey, and a significant step backward in the design of Elite Dangerous. It's an awful, grindy mess that is wholly dependent on random loot mechanics that make the actual time to acquire materials unpredictable. Each Tier 3 suit or weapon that you can buy at an outfitter is saving you literal hours of effort and work, so they are worth every credit. Often these Tier 3 kits do not have engi any engineering blueprints attached, so you still have a blank slate to work with that won't shoehorn you a specific direction. And you don't have to have any engineers unlocked to find and purchase these suits. The engineers in Odyssey work in much the same way they did in Horizons. Each engineer insists that the player do something notable to get their attention, either by completing an in-game task or by earning favor with another gatekeeper engineer. A few engineers then have an additional prerequisite requirement and a follow-on referral requirement that unlocks the next engineer, if any. Unlike in Horizons, where the player then needs to rank up reputation with the engineer by purchasing blueprints, Odyssey gives you the engineer's entire selection of suit upgrades from the start, with the only limiting factor being the available upgrade slots on the individual suits or guns, which the player must first upgrade at a Pioneer Outfitter, before taking them to an engineer to receive a specific engineering mod. As with ships, these mods are very powerful, and are essential for higher level activities in Odyssey. Though the Tier 3 kit can get you by with careful positioning, gameplay in high intensity Odyssey combat zones, or high security settlements, is very unforgiving with underleveled kit. The Odyssey ground combat model is exceptionally slow paced, with a lot of verticality. Times to kill are some of the longest you'll find in any shooter, far exceeding other RP arcade FPS titles like Halo and Apex Legends. Player movement is also much more restrained than either of the former. Slow movement speeds and long times to kill mean that combat is much less tactical or reflex-based compared to games like Call of Duty or Battlefield, an issue that makes most engagements a matter of brute force attrition. Gunplay feels awkward on the controller, which remains my favorite personal input for shooters. There are basically no aim assist mechanics in Odyssey for any input method. 
which makes aiming and firing feel a lot like it does in Apex Legends. But the weapons lack the character or customization that's available in Apex, though the designs are consistent between the different manufacturers, and the models are detailed enough to be recognizable in the hands of NPCs during combat. Odyssey copies the same weapon types and damage modeling from ships, and applies them to ground combat, albeit with greatly reduced damage and health by comparison. Kinetic and explosive weapons are made by Kinematic, thermal weapons are made by Takata, plasma weapons by Manticore. There are also consumables like grenades and health packs, though I'm not sure who makes them and I don't think it matters much. As with ships, suit shields are best damaged by thermal weapons, and suit armor best done off by kinetic or explosive damage. Using the wrong weapon, for the wrong task results in a significant damage debuff that almost doubles the amount of actual damage required to kill. So there's an exceptionally strong incentive to use the right weapon at the right time. Plasma weapons, as with ships, deal absolute damage and so perform more consistently, but their projectiles move much more slowly, making them harder to use than thermal or kinetic weapons, in addition to coming in more specialized forms. The only dedicated shotgun and sniper rifle on offer in Odyssey are plasma weapons. Between the two, the shotgun is the more practical, with less effort, and so gets used more often in Odyssey than the sniper, which is effectively a handheld plasma accelerator. That sniper can absolutely nuke a target if you can connect a shot, but the slow shot speed makes crack sniper gameplay impractical at the long ranges this weapon was intended for. Pair that with a small magazine and a long reload time, and you end up with a DPS that is very low compared to the other rifles on offer. Even when used by a skilled player, effective range rarely exceeds the perimeter of the settlement you are in, which means that you won't be posting up on that hill in the outskirts to channel your inner Chris Kyle. Most shots will be taken from one building to another less than 100 meters away and you'll probably still miss because dodgeballs get thrown faster than the sniper shots fly, and NPCs can dodge them accidentally as they pathfind their way to a capture point. Capture points remain the only real mechanism by which ground combat zones operate. At any given moment, there can be up to three, with each successful capture clearing the current point and opening up a slot for another point to spawn at a random location. This forces both capturing factions to move around the settlement while a mostly irrelevant air battle takes place in the skies above. These ships can do little to influence the flow of combat on the ground, with the exception of player-controlled ships being potentially able to conduct ground strafing runs, though even in open play this behavior is rare and unlikely to happen in a typical ground game. Depending on the settlement, and certain BGS conditions, a number of anti-air turrets can spawn around the settlement, which fire on ships in the zone, that are hostile to the current settlement faction. These turrets are dangerous to small and medium ships, even with engineering, and are fairly resistant to ship weapons, but they can be readily disabled by ground teams to help facilitate air superiority. Though, unless you have a friendly commander in the skies with a ship specifically fitted for ground attack, this mechanic is unhelpful to the actual ground engagement, and it requires a maverick suit to cut into the turret and disable it. This is one of the only cases where a maverick suit has a required use in ground engagement, though, as mentioned earlier, both the maverick and Artemis suits can be adapted for combat applications without being outright useless, though they are at a marked disadvantage when directly confronted by a player in a dominator suit. In theory, the Artemis suit would make for an excellent recon sniper, posting up on the outskirts of a settlement, far away from the power sockets that a dominator suit is dependent on and harass targets at ranges requiring the Dominators to move away from the infrastructure that keeps them effective. Likewise, the Maverick suit, with higher durability and utility than the Artemis, can engage at medium range and act as general combat support. It would likely be a popular second option if there were more interactable systems at settlement combat zones, though at the time of writing, none of the control panels, base systems, or maintenance cutouts are active and capable of influencing the fight. In addition, there are no salvageable materials or data of any kind, so there's no real reason to use a Maverick over a Dominator aside from personal preference or engineering limitations. And limitations there will be in the early game, 
as the Maverick suit is an essential requirement to collect things you need to engineer the other suits. It is for this reason I highly recommend focusing all active engineering efforts on the Maverick suit first, enhancing things like backpack capacity and tool efficiency to make scavenging and mission running less logistically complicated. Logistical complexity being the two best words to describe the engineering system in Odyssey. This aggravating system has been the main reason I've delayed making a video about Elite Dangerous Odyssey for so long, as it's somehow even more grindy and frustrating than the Horizon system, and represents a massive step backwards in the design of the game. A significant portion of the materials and data encountered on the ground are literally useless, fit only for trading at station bars for the things that actually matter. However, the maximum storage space allotted to a player is 1,000 units, a figure which is very deliberately not enough to collect and store all the materials needed for all the blueprints. This is regressive because Elite Dangerous ship engineering used to work this way, and change the model to what it is now, where each material has dedicated storage space and players are free to collect and build up enough of these materials when and where they want to be spent at their discretion. For reasons that have never been fully explained, likely because they know we won't like the explanation, Odyssey decided to go back to this older design. Doing so means that players can only collect enough materials to work on a few specific blueprints at a time in addition to the massive amount of materials required to upgrade suits for the engineering blueprints in the first place. This means that players, through the course of normal gameplay, will be forced to trade out materials that they will need later on in order to get the materials that they need right now. This amounts to forcing arbitrary waste into a game system that makes me actively resent the mechanic enough so that it took me getting bored of every other game in my library to even consider spending time on it, a process which eventually resulted in this video. To be fair though, Odyssey is doing something right because I do still keep playing, and there is still something relaxing about engaging with an uncomplicated task with my favorite podcast playing in the background. The environmental sound design remains excellent, even if the movement mechanics aren't always the best or the most realistic. In microgravity, players move about as if they are full G, until they hit the jump button and spend the next 7 seconds drifting lazily through the air on a very predictable arc that even NPCs can't miss. There is an audible warning that plays when exiting ships, and a visual indicator for current gravity on screen, though the full implication of this information rarely seeks in until you try and jump, so be careful where you do it. Having a ground component installed and active also means that the game will, necessarily, be forced to design or redesign future systems around it, which I believe will eventually bleed into things like ship interiors, more advanced station and outpost interiors, zero-gravity interactions, and hopefully ship-to-ship -ship boarding actions. Odyssey has been called a foundation for the future, and I do believe Frontier when they say that. But, this means that there really isn't much difference in concept between what Elite Dangerous is doing and what Star Citizen has been doing. Both products ultimately describe themselves as platforms onto which new technology and features are being constantly added, and both claim ambitions that extend to the end of the decade and beyond. Elite Dangerous has the advantage of being more grounded in reality and focused on what it knows it can do right now. So large updates are rare and followed by several months, or more recently a whole year, of patches and hotfixes that eventually stabilize and polish the experience. In spite of my above criticism, this game itself has all the ingredients in the pot to be more enjoyable, with most of the current issues being ones of tuning and balancing. The engineering system, as currently implemented, is boring and tedious, with multiple mechanics that feel designed to waste player time. It takes too long to acquire materials, and storage space is far too restrictive to support the current demands for materials. The hunt for these materials requires RNG mechanics that make it impossible to predict how much time things will take, and there are virtually no alternatives to acquiring materials that don't involve stealing or scavenging. Engineering and upgrade blueprints need to have their requirements dramatically reduced, and new avenues to earn critical upgrade materials need to be provided. Bartenders should act as actual marketplaces, with active inventories that players can buy with credits, even if that inventory is randomized. 
Settlement combat zones should have more active interactables that Maverick Suit operators can use to meaningfully alter the combat environment, in addition to having materials and data available to scavenge during combat or have material rewards available from Frontier Solutions on successful victory conditions, in addition to providing them for successful mission completion. Additional options for close-range and long-range weapons should be available, having a sniper rifle in kinetic and thermal damage types to provide better ranged engagement options, as well as having a kinetic shotgun on offer would help extend combat distances and provide more viable options for the Artemis suit to participate in combat. Additional settlement capture objectives should also be considered. Rather than making players wander around to specific randomized capture points, have players focus on capturing one building at a time, with specific requirements to complete an a capture against defenders who are already in place. These engagements can end around the settlement's control center, or the closest thing to it, and could require specific interactions with terminals or other fixtures to facilitate building entry and takeover. This would provide Maverick operators a direct and meaningful contribution to combat that makes them mission critical. Ground objectives should be communicated to ships in combat, with more interaction between air and ground support. Since buildings have fixed entry and exit points, having NPC air support strafe hostile buildings, or the areas around them, would incentivize players to leverage and interact with air defenses, making them a key part of effective strategy, especially in high-intensity zones. It's my opinion that these changes would help improve the overall experience and make for a much more approachable overall game. But what do you all think? That's all I have today, so I'll catch you all later.